report and findings and recommendations, and I will certainly ensure that that happens. And the point about local engagement is a good one, and that should also happen. Thank you. We move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, this morning I convened a meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee to discuss the ongoing suspension of flights to and from Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. My officials are in close contact with UK government officials and will continue to be so. There are, we understand, currently around 20,000 British nationals in Sharm el Sheikh, and we estimate at this stage that at least several hundred of these are Scots. Transport Scotland is in touch with Thompson's Holidays to discuss the support and advice that is being provided, and I want to assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government will continue to liaise closely with UK government colleagues to ensure that all appropriate support is in place. Uh, and later today, Presiding Officer, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Okay, so officer, across the UK, Labour will fight the Tory government's attempt to cut tax credits. We want George Osborne to scrap his plan altogether. But if he doesn't, this Parliament must act to protect working families. Despite days of protesting that it wasn't possible, yesterday the SNP government finally admitted that we will have the power to restore money lost through tax credits. The Social Justice Secretary said measures would be outlined after the autumn statement. But unlike their £250 million plan to abolish air passenger duty, we have no detail on how much the SNP are willing to spend to help working families. In fact, for weeks, the Deputy First Minister said restoring tax credits was unaffordable. So can the First Minister confirm? Does she agree with her finance secretary that spending hundreds of millions of pounds to make airline tickets cheaper is affordable, but restoring tax credits isn't? First Minister. Well, presiding officer, okay. let me set out the position of the Scottish Government. Firstly, over these next three weeks, we intend to keep up the pressure on George Osborne to drop his plans for tax credit cuts. Unlike Unlike Labour, who, remember, initially abstained in the House of Commons on this issue, the SNP have consistently opposed these cuts. And I think it is all too typical of Scottish Labour. Just when the pressure is building across the UK on George Osborne, they ease up on the Tories and attack the SNP instead. It seems... It seems... Presiding officer, the old habits and old friendships really do die hard. So we'll keep up the pressure on the Tories to drop these cuts altogether. And if they don't completely reverse these cuts, then what we will do as a responsible government is bring forward credible, deliverable and affordable plans to protect low-income households, just as we did on the bedroom tax. Now, I think... Order! Because... Order! Because if we remember, presiding Order. officer... First of all, on the bedroom tax, Labour brought forward a plan that would have been illegal and unworkable. It was this government that brought forward one that worked. Now, I think that, frankly, is a far better plan and it's far fairer for people who are affected by these cuts than back of a fag packet proposals from a party that knows it has little chance of ever being in a position to implement them. Mr. 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 The First Minister forgets that it was a Labour government that introduced yeah. the tax credit. And we will do everything we can to protect them, including using the powers of this parliament. Now, no matter what George Osborne does at the autumn statement, Scottish Labour is committed to restoring the money lost through tax credits for working families. Because we have made a choice. We know it's affordable. We've costed it at its most expensive. And we know that any concessions from the Chancellor will only reduce that cost. And we think it's more important than a multi-million pound plan to reduce the cost of airline tickets. There are... Order. Miss, Mr. Deal, continue. Order. Order. 
order. Let us hear Ms Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. President officer, there are 6,000 families in the First Minister's constituency who rely on tax credits and they deserve a bit more than a vague assurance from the SNP that the government will act. So can the First Minister confirm to those 6,000 families and the thousands more across the country, will the Scottish Government's proposals ensure that when the new powers are available, every single family will receive the same entitlement from the government as they do now? Yes or no? First Minister. Repeat. Let me repeat what I said in my first answer. We will continue to oppose these cuts at source. Order. Unlike Labour, who when it came to a vote in the House of Commons, abstained on the issue of tax credit cuts. So we will we'll oppose the cuts. But if the cuts go ahead, we will bring forward a credible, workable, deliverable, affordable plan Order, to Mr. Findlay. low-income households. And can I say to Kezia Dugdale, the detail of this to families out there who are affected really matters. And one of the details that matters most is how this policy would be paid for. Now, Kezia Dugdale has mentioned air passenger duty as the source of the funding or a source of the funding for this. Now, let's put to one side for the purposes of today the fact that that money wouldn't actually be available when she was required to pay for the tax credits policy. Let's put that to one side and instead, presiding officer, consider this. The day before Kezia Dugdale announced the policy on tax credits, here's what she had to say about air passenger duty. In an interview in the Holyrood magazine, the day before she announced her position on tax credits, she said, Labour will scrap the air passenger duty measure and we will spend that money on education. So in the space, in the space, presiding officer, Order. of 24 hours, Labour managed to spend the same sum of money twice over. Now, can I say, in all seriousness, to Kezia Dugdale, that is basic incompetence. And the people of Scotland, frankly, deserve better. You know, we've, we've known for some time that the public thinks Labour is unelectable. I think what we found out this week is that Labour thinks Labour is unelectable. <laughs> It's less Keir Hardy, presiding officer, more Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> Ms Dugdale, can you try and keep this brief? And First Minister, can you try and keep that next answer brief too? Ms Dugdale. Presiding officer, all of that from a party that's had three different positions on tax credits in the last 24 ah. hours. Because if the last few days have taught us anything, it's that this government needs to be held to account. Yesterday in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister told working families they just have to wait and see what happened next. Today in this chamber, the First Minister is saying exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Now, I've listened to Nicola Sturgeon very carefully. I've listened to Alex Neil very carefully on the TV last night. Both have said that they will ensure that the income of those in receipt of tax credits won't fall. But that sounds a little like the Tory argument that higher wages will automatically make up the difference. So can I ask the First Minister again, under the Scottish Government's proposal, will every single family receive the same entitlement from the government as they do now? First Minister. I, I'm not quite sure what it is that's difficult to understand. I don't yet accept that these cuts will take place because there is pressure building on George Osborne to reverse them. So I think right now that's where we should be united in making sure the pressure stays on the Tories. And if George Osborne does the wrong thing, then we will come forward with credible proposals to protect low-income families. And do you know what? People around this country who are worried about their tax credits deserve more than slogans. They deserve detail from a government Order. that they know can deliver. You know, I referred earlier on to Kezia Dugdale's Order. interview in the Holyrood magazine. There was actually something else there 
that was illuminating. She was narrating a conversation with a Welsh minister. She asked him, where are you finding the money from for your big commitments? And he said, they would worry about that later. And Kezia said, I was quite impressed by the boldness of that. <laughs> Presiding officer, most people would be utterly appalled by the incompetence of that. So I'll leave Labour in the la-la land that they increasingly inhabit and get on with the job of governing this country in the interests of the people we serve. Briefly, Ms Bugdale. The truth is, presiding officer, that this is the week that the SNP's constitutional games came unstuck. Because after years of responding to every problem with complaints about the Constitution, Alex Neil finally gave the game away. For this was the week that the SNP had to admit that the new powers heading our way can transform Scotland. The week that the SNP had to confront the fact that difficult choices will have to be made. So will the First Minister now give up the politics of grievance? Will she now look to the future of what is possible, move on from the past and just get on with delivering a fairer Scotland? First Minister. You know, there's one place and one place only in the UK where Labour can be judged on their actions, not on their words. And in Wales, which I referred to a moment ago, Labour don't even mitigate the bedroom tax. That's the reality of Labour in government. So I'll continue, firstly, to concentrate on forcing the Tories to abandon these cuts. You know the reason Labour won't do likewise? It's because, in the words of their shadow chancellor last weekend, and I quote, the SNP is the real enemy. And there's the nub of this matter. Labour is not motivated by concern for ordinary people. It hasn't been for a long, long Order. time. Labour. Labour is motivated by its tribal hatred of the SNP. Well, I think the enemy of working people in Scotland are the Tories. It's just a shame Labour seem to have forgotten that. Yeah. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, earlier this week, a leading group of education experts led by Keir Bloomer, a former Director of Education, questioned this government's plans to help pupils from poorer background. Its report concluded that it was not persuaded that strategies that will be needed for success are yet in place. Presiding Officer, we all want more poorer pupils to be able to get the grades to go to good universities. This expert group says that the plans the SNP are putting in place simply won't do that. Can the First Minister tell me why these experts are wrong? First Minister. Well, I hope, Kizzy, uh, Ruth Davidson rather, I struggle to <laughs> tell between them these days. I hope Ruth Davidson, even if she doesn't agree with my policy, would accept that I have made very clear how serious I am about improving education in Scotland and closing the attainment gap. I read the report she refers to with interest. I don't agree with every aspect of it, but I thought it was an interesting contribution. I'm actually meeting the author of the report, Keir Bloomer, uh, next week to discuss the report and how uh, him and the other uh, members of his team can contribute to Scottish Government thinking on this. So we are serious about this. That's why already we have more than 300 primary schools across the country already already benefiting from the additional resources of the Attainment Fund. It's why work is continuing apace on the National Improvement Framework, which, amongst other things, for the first time in primary schools, will give us the chance to actually measure reliably improvement in our education and the closing of the education gap. Now, we are seeing evidence of the attainment gap in Scotland closing. It's not far enough and fast enough for my liking, which is why I'm determined that we go further and faster. So I've said to Ruth Davidson before, and I say it uh, to everybody across the chamber, uh, I am open to suggestions. I always have been. I don't think I've had any uh, from anywhere across the chamber, but uh, there is no doubt whatsoever, there is no doubt whatsoever that this is a priority for me and for my government, and it will continue to be so. Ruth Davidson. Right, officer, I thank the First Minister for that answer, telling the Chamber how seriously she now takes the attainment gap. She didn't, however, provide the full facts. Because under freedom of information, we have obtained the latest figures on the number of students getting three A's at higher, which is one of the measures for getting into a good university, and it is not 
pretty reading. We knew that the SNP government was not closing the attainment gap, but now from these figures, we know that that gap between the richest and poorest students is actually getting wider. In fact, in four local authorities, not a single pupil from the least affluent homes attained three A's in their hires, whereas a wealthier pupil is now seven times more likely to get three A's than their more deprived peers. We will publish all of these figures this afternoon. The First Minister has said she wants to be judged on her record. In education, her record is one of failure, and the experts say that her plans won't fix it. So I will ask her, how bad do things have to get before we see the action we need? First Minister. Well, as Ruth Davidson knows, uh, we are taking action, and we will continue to take action. And I... I'm not standing here. I never have stood here and said that there's not more work to do. That's why we have taken the action around the attainment challenge that I've already talked about. Uh, but we are seeing, in many respects, evidence of the attainment gap narrowing. So in 2007, for example, 23% of pupils from the 20% most deprived areas got at least one higher. That figure is now 40 when you look at qualifications at level five, the gap between the 10% most deprived and the 10% least deprived has fallen from 42.5% to 26%. So these are uh, figures that evidence some progress, but it's not progress that is enough for me, and I wouldn't expect it to be progress that is enough for anyone. That is why we're putting so much emphasis on the attainment work. And, you know, Ruth Davidson can cite higher results. I can cite higher results. As I've said before, one of the problems we have is that we can't cite that evidence from earlier on in a child's uh, school progress. So by the time it gets to higher, if you haven't dealt with the attainment gap, then perhaps it's too late to do so. That's why the national improvement framework is so important, so that we can start dealing with this, not even in primary school, uh, but start dealing with in early years through primary school, so that we see the improvements later on in school uh, careers. That's the emphasis we're putting on this work, and I would hope Ruth Davidson would welcome it. Lolly Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the announcement by Stuttgart-based Mala Engineering in Kilmarnock that over 170 jobs are to be lost in the Bearings Finishing Department of Order. the business by January next year, and that the company plans to move this production to other plants in Europe, despite the renowned quality of the bearings produced by the Kilmarnock staff over many years and the solid performance of the company worldwide. Uh, would the First Minister see what intervention might be possible with the company in order to try to save these jobs and help prevent yet another jobs body blow to the town? First Minister. Uh, well, can I welcome Willie Coffey's question. I share his concern at the announcement of possible redundancies at the Mali Group in Kilmarnock and I'm sure this will be a very worrying time for all affected employees. I can confirm that Scottish Enterprise has offered support to the company and will meet with senior management next week to discuss it. I can also confirm that our PACE team will meet with the company next week uh, to discuss a tailored programme of PACE support for any employees who may be facing redundancy. So the Scottish Government will take any action we possibly can and I know the Enterprise Minister would be very happy to discuss it in more detail with Willie Coffey. Question three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. This week, the Education Secretary had an online Q&A. Not one person agreed with Angela Constance about the national standardised testing. And the international experts at the OECD warned that the risk of national testing was narrowing the curriculum and teaching to the test. One of the issues is league tables. The First Minister told me she was against league tables, but she's told journalists that she's not going to stop them putting primary schools into league tables. If she doesn't want them, why is she going ahead and taking all the steps to allow them to happen? First Minister. Well, I may, may have escaped Willie Rennie's notice. I, I don't control the newspapers. Uh, perhaps if I did, things would be very different. Um, but, you know... There's something quite, for me, quite reassuring here because on the one hand I've got Ruth Davidson telling me I'm not going far enough in terms of school reform and on the other hand I've got Willie Rennie telling me I'm going far too far in school reform. That tells me we're probably in exactly the right place in terms of reforming our schools and how we measure uh, the uh, performance of our schools and the attainment gap. Uh, I stand by what I said. I have no interest in crude league tables that offer no meaning 
to parents, nor do I have any interest in a system that would encourage teaching to the test. But I do think it is incumbent on me as First Minister to make sure uh, that children's progress is being assessed in a way that better informs the judgments teachers make about their performance and also that allows all of us to have a, a meaningful and evidence debate in this chamber and across Scotland about whether we are or are not making progress in closing the attainment gap. I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. We'll continue to discuss the detail of our plans with teachers, with local authorities, with parents and with others. But I'm determined, as I said to Ruth Davidson, that we do make real progress on this uh, and I'll push forward with it for that reason. Well, Rennie. So league tables are coming and she's not convinced, she has not convinced one single person that she's going to stop them. The OECD say of equal importance is consensus building amongst the various stakeholders involved. But Professor Brian Boyd, who was a member of the curriculum review group, said it was a retrograde step. Head teacher George Gilchrist said it's a definite step backwards. The IS said testing would have a profoundly negative impact. The Parent Teacher Council concluded testing does not raise attainment. Why is the government's approach to consensus building just to tell all these people they are all wrong? First Minister. No, uh, although I will tell Willie Rennie, he's wrong. We're not introducing high stakes testing. We're introducing assessment, assessment that is carried out in most local authorities anyway, in a standardised way so that we can use it appropriately and it's assessment that will help inform teachers judgments about the performance of children and we will continue to work as we are doing right now with teachers and with others uh, to uh, finalize how we will make use of that information how we will publish that inform information in a way that doesn't uh, lead to crude league table so that's the way we'll continue to get on with this and Willie Rennie's twice I think mentioned the OECD we should in the not too distant future get the OECD's latest report on the performance of Scottish education I look forward to receiving that uh, and hopefully that will be a useful contribution to our ongoing work in this area but this is an area I have said repeatedly and will continue to do so is one that I have set as a priority and I'm going to continue to treat it in that way. Question four, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on how the UK Government's latest amendments to the Scotland Bill could impact on the governance of Scotland. First Minister. Well, I think it's been quite interesting this week, is it not, that a bill that was claimed to deliver the vow in full when it was first introduced needed so many amendments to make it supposedly deliver the vow now. Uh, now, I think the amendments improved the bill in some key areas, particularly the late amendment that was lodged uh, yesterday by the UK government. I think it still far, falls far, far short in other areas. Uh, but of course, in terms of whether the bill delivers on promises made, it will be for the people to be the judge of that in the election next May. Uh, SNP MPs will propose further amendments in the House of Commons next week, including one to deliver real power over tax credits in the entirety and we call on all members to support those. More generally our priority now is to agree a fair fiscal framework so that we can get on with using these new powers for the benefit of the people we serve. Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Uh, the Scotland Bill goes nowhere near delivering on the Smith Com Commission proposals, never mind fulfilling the vow. Does the First Minister share the view of a number of third sector organisations that the proposed devolution of the work programme, while Westminster, Westminster retains power over sanctions, are incoherent and illogical, like so many other proposals contained in this bill? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Benefit conditionality and employability, as anybody knows, go hand in hand, and they should have been fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And Kevin Stewart is right to point out that many stakeholders called for that. I think that is symptomatic of the approach that the UK Government has taken. Uh, the employment provisions in the Bill do fall short of the Smith recommendations. Uh, there's no justification, in my view, for insisting that we wait 12 months before stepping in to help someone who's unemployed. The social security provisions in the bill are still, uh, notwithstanding welcome improvements, uh, are still full of qualifications and constraints, including, most importantly, perhaps, those in benefit sanctions. Uh, the sanctions regime has been shown to push people into crisis, and it's one of the main drivers of food banks, which is why uh, we've been very clear that there's an urgent need for a full and independent review of the whole sanctions system. Annabel Goldie. 
Officer, given the shambles we saw in this Parliament in yesterday's welfare debate from the SNP, with the First Minister's colleague, Mr Neill, confirming in reference to the Scotland Bill and his desire to reverse tax credits that, and I quote, the amendments that were tabled today should give the Scottish Parliament that power, only to subsequently move an amendment in his name in this Parliament that said the exact opposite. Does the First Minister agree her government needs to move on, stop caterwauling at Westminster, and start telling us, start telling us how her government... Ms. Goldie, start conclude. telling us how her government will actually use these extensive new powers. I have to say, presiding officer, 10 out of 10 for sheer brass neck from Baroness Goldie. Baroness Goldie, let me remind the chamber, and more importantly, let me remind the whole of Scotland, sat in the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago and voted for tax credit cuts that will penalise low-income families. So let me say, it will be a long time before I'm prepared to take any lectures in this chamber from Baroness Goldie on the issue of tax credits. Question five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide assistance to families who lose tax credits as a result of the UK Government's proposals. First Minister. Well, as I said earlier, Presiding Officer, we intend to keep up pressure on the Chancellor to drop his plans to cut tax credits. If he doesn't do so, we will bring forward credible and deliverable plans to assist low-income families. This is in line with the approach we've already taken to mitigate welfare cuts, including the bedroom tax, an approach that is backed this year alone by more than £100 million of investment. Jackie Bailey. Can I say as gently as I can to the First Minister that this isn't about her, it's not about the SNP, it's not even about the shambles that we witnessed from Alex Neil yesterday. This is about the 250,000 families that are set to lose £1,300 a year due to the Tory cuts to tax credits. Protecting income is not the same as restoring tax credits in full. Her careful language tells me that she knows this. So let's cut through all the words. I only require a one-syllable answer. Will the First Minister help working families and restore every penny lost through tax credit cuts? Yes or no? First well, Minister. Jackie is right. Order. Here's, <coughs> here's words I never thought I'd utter, Presiding Officer. Jackie Bailey is right about one thing. This is about the families across Scotland who stand to lose tax credits. That is why they deserve better than game playing. They deserve from their government real, detailed, credible, deliverable, affordable plans and that's what they will get. But it really is a bit rich for Jackie Bailey to stand in this, almost as rich as it was for Annabel Goldie, to stand in this chamber and talk about cuts to the incomes of poor families when just two days ago she pressed her button and voted to spend £167 billion renewing Trident nuclear weapons on the Clyde. Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister at what level the Scottish rate of income tax will be set. First Minister. In a radical new departure, we'll announce that in the budget. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. At the weekend, the Scottish Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn announced its plans to raise taxes on the Scottish people. The Scottish Conservatives will vigorously oppose any moves to tax families or businesses in Scotland more highly than the rest of the United Kingdom. So where does the First Minister stand on this issue? Will she join with us and today rule out, rule out higher taxes on families and businesses in Scotland? Yes or no? First Minister. You should, you should advise uh, your colleague Alec Johnson when you're encouraging me to join with you, you shouldn't have him sitting leering at me in that kind of strange way that he's just done. It is extremely, extremely off-putting. Anyway, presiding officer. Order. Presiding officer, if I can recover my composure for just a second. We'll announce our tax plans in the budget, as most governments tend to do. But I have to say, tax really is the last thing the Tories should be talking about 
right now. The tax credit cuts that we've been talking about today would effectively raise the tax rate uh, for some low-paid workers to 90 per cent. Right now, it is the Tories that are the party of high tax on low-income households. So perhaps Murdo Fraser would be better advised, rather than, as I believe he did yesterday, endorse George Osborne's plans, join his leader in asking George Osborne to reverse these cuts, just like we do. I do think, First Minister, that Mr Johnson is not in the habit of leering in this chamber. Um, that ends First Minister's question time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.